Hi, Mark Donovan here from Falcon Imagery, and today I'm going to go over the topic of instrument rating privileges and limitations. They're sometimes hard to find uh, in the literature uh, from the FAA, but if you look hard enough, you can find them. And I'm going to make your life a little bit easy here. I'm going to consolidate them here in the next uh, few minutes so you can quickly understand what your privileges are as an instrument rated pilot and what your limitations are. So follow along, and if you like this video, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to this channel so you get notified when I come out with my next video. All right, instrument rating privileges and limitations. As an instrument rated pilot, you may act as the pilot in command of an aircraft operating under IFR per 91.155. You can fly day or night in IMC conditions, for example, IFR conditions, which are between one and three statue miles visibility and 500 to 1,000 foot ceilings, and or flying clouds. You can operate in Class A airspace, if you remember right. Class A airspace is instrument rules, flight rules only. Um, you can obtain a special VFR clearance at night. Um, <clears throat> you can also fly a special VFR clearance as a private pilot without an instrument rating. Um, during the day, but in order to fly special VFR clearance or to get that at, at night, you need the IFR rating. That's why it's listed here. Um, you can carry passengers for hire on cross-country flights in excess of 50 nautical miles between sun sunset and sunrise, if you also hold that commercial pilot certificate. Um, um, you can hold a commercial pilot certificate without having an instrument rating, but and again, in order to go beyond that 50 nautical miles, after sunset to sunrise with passengers for hire, you need that instrument rating along with that commercial pilot certificate. Um, you can, of course, file an IFR flight plan as an instrument rated pilot. Uh, you can fly instrument approaches. And you can fly for pleasure, personal travel, or business travel. And lastly, you can carry passengers and share the flight expenses equally if you're just a private pilot. Now let's look at the limitations. As an IFR pilot, you may not fly under IFR if the aircraft is not properly equipped for IFR uh, equipment, per 91.205. Uh, you may not fly under IFR if you have not completed all FAA recurrent training requirements, uh, meanings, uh, meaning you have an instrument rating and you've um, maintained currency in terms of six approaches within the previous six months, as well as holds, course intercept, and tracking. That all needs to be shown and available in your logbook. Uh, you may not fly IFR operated outside of controlled airspace with certain exceptions. For example, departing out of a Class G airport uh, with a released IFR clearance, uh, you can you know, fly IFR conditions in that Class G till you get to the overlaying Class um, Echo airspace. Uh, per 91.167, no person may operate an aircraft in IFR conditions unless it carries enough fuel, considering weather reports and forecast and weather conditions, to complete the flight to the first airport of intended landing, fly from that airport to the alternate airport, and fly after that for 45 minutes at normal cruising speed. Um, and I should also point out that, even though it's not stated here, should also, you should also allow in your fuel um, management or planning for shooting approaches at each of those airports and doing at least one hole. So this hole, 91.167, uh, is um, maybe more of an operational limitation, but I think it's important to um, talk about it here because uh, it differs uh, from a private pilot uh, certificate um, where you only need a 30-minute reserve a day or 45 minutes at night. Um, a little bit more on instrument rating limitations. These aren't necessarily uh, specific to any rules, but more make sense from a logical and safe perspective. So just because you have an instrument rating and the aircraft is instrument equipped doesn't mean it's smart to fly IFR at all uh, times. When, for example, departure airport visibility and ceilings are zero, zero, no visibility, no ceilings. Under Part 91, technically you can do that, but under Part 121 and 135 operations, you can't. So if they, the big boys can't, then most likely you shouldn't be doing it as well. Um, so keep that in mind. Just because you can, it's not necessarily a smart idea to do. When there's no practical alternate for you to fly to in the event your airport of intended arrival doesn't meet the 321 rule. So if you remember the 321 rule is associated with um, within plus or minus one hour of your expected time of arrival at your airport, you need 
uh, three statue miles of visibility and at least 2,000 foot ceilings. If you don't have that, you have to follow an alternate. As you can see in the picture in the bottom right, uh, if I was flying from someplace in New Hampshire down to the South Shore of Boston, there's not a lot of options. There's no options all the way out through the entire Northeast to all of New England. So it wouldn't be a smart day to go um, fly and to, to fly an IFR flight. As you can see here by the pink, those are low IFR conditions. So you're really in a, a pickle there if you happen to be able to get into, um, try to make an approach for an IFR approach into one of those airports down toward the uh, South Shore. Um, next, when the route of flight is going to have known icing conditions and your aircraft is not equipped for de-icing or anti-icing equipment, you shouldn't be planning to do an IFR flight. Even if your aircraft does have de-icing or anti-icing equipment on board, it's best to think of that equipment as tools in the event you accidentally get into icing conditions. I really don't recommend um, getting yourself into known icing conditions, um, even with when your plane's equipped with some anti-icing or de-icing capability particularly if you're not uh, comfortable or, or, or well-versed in using it. Sometimes uh, with certain aircraft like weeping wings type de-icing capability, really that's more of an anti-icing thing. If you let the ice build up on the leading edge of that wing and then attempt to de-ice it um, by having this, um, the, the fluid sprayed out, you may find out all those um, little micro holes in the leading edge of the wing are frozen over and you have no de-icing capability on that wing. So those are the privileges and limitations of an instrument rating, both from a regulatory standpoint as well as from a practical standpoint. Hopefully you found this video useful. If you did, consider hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel so you get notified when I come out with my next video.